John, we have someone on the podcast as the big get who loves sports media as much as we do. Peter Schrager. Of Fox, NFL Net, you name it. But the big story of the week, Andrew, the Big 12 doing its media deal. We have a lot of information on the Big 12, the Back 12, what it means for college football, everything. Max Duggan. It's to Kendra Miller. Right up the gut goes Miller. He's gone. Touchdown. <laughs> And we're back, the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran. Our good buddy there, John Arad. Is- the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. John, this week, Peter Schrager, big get. Uh, we had that conversation already. It's going to come up in a little while. Really good. Really into media. Yeah, what, what I love at your opening, when you say like he loves sports media as much as we do, he really does. Man, we, 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 we couldn't get him off the pod. It was great, though. And some information, some intel on Sean McVay, who Schrager is very close with, the Rams coach who Amazon had interest in and could have a future in TV. Uh, so a lot of good stuff with Schrager. Last week, uh, a lot of nice feedback about Joe Davis now calling the World Series uh, Fox's new play-by-player on baseball. They're number two on the NFL. Uh, that was a fun interview with Joe Davis. Andrew, I had a, a somebody that said it was the best interview that we've had. The guy was from the Midwest, Joe Davis, of course, from the Midwest. I think it's all that Midwestern kindness is coming in, but it, it was good. It, listen, listen back if you didn't listen to that one. All right, Traeger in a moment, but let's first go who's up and who's down. Who's up? Who's down? Hey, Andrew, let me uh, lead it off. Uh, my who's up, Nick Dawson of ESPN. Why not Burke Magnus? We reserve who's down for Burke Magnus. But uh, Nick Dawson reports to Burke Magnus, worked on the Big 12 deal. I could have picked uh, Mark Silverman over at Fox. I could have picked Brett Yormark, the commissioner of, of the Big 12. It's rare that you have a deal that you feel like is a good deal for all the parties involved. And I feel like this was a good deal for the Big 12. It got a lot of stability for the Big 12. This is a good deal for Fox. It, it enabled them to keep a toehold in, in college football with uh, other, other conferences beyond uh, the, the Big 10. And it was a great deal for, for ESPN, which is why I put Nick Dawson in there. When they uh, got out of the running for the Big 10, it, you know, everybody was taking a look at what they were going to do with the Big 12 and with the Pac-12. We thought they were going to be aggressive. They were aggressive. They got the, this deal done early, and they're showing that they are going to remain a big power in college sports. All right, that's going to be topic one, so we'll get more to that uh, in a minute. All right, my who's up? LeBron James. You're saying, wait, LeBron James? The Lakers are terrible. It's, a, it's awful out in L.A. No, no. LeBron James, media mogul. Uh, last week, Amazon announced – that LeBron is going to do a alternative broadcast November 17th on a uh, Packers game uh, against the Titans. And uh, it's with the shop and Maverick Carter. And, and here's the situation here. Like, do I expect that to be some great show? Well, it might be. We'll, we'll have to see what it looks like. But it's the power these superstar athletes have. We saw it with the Tom Brady deal, 10 years, $375 million. We see it with Peyton Manning, what he's building with Omaha Productions. Now, LeBron, who already started this a long time ago, like he's already been building this. I think there's been reports he's a billionaire. I have not seen his taxes. I don't know the exact numbers, but he's on his way. And you look at it for Amazon. Why do that deal? It's a basketball player doing the NFL. Even though LeBron, I think, did play football, maybe not in high school, but as a kid. And it's talked about playing the NFL. And he's LeBron. Uh, But the NBA deal comes up in three years. Right. Charles Barkley is the king of NBA media in terms of personalities and one of the greatest players of all time. LeBron is in the argument for the actual greatest player of all time. It's it's him or Jordan, most people would say, regardless of what you think. Those type of people who are interested in media uh, are able to build things. Amazon now is beginning that relationship. You look how Peyton Manning, the relationship with ESPN uh, came to fruition. Uh, Jimmy Pitaro, the chairman of ESPN, worked on that for years and years. And obviously he's giving them, you know, million, I'd say it's in the 20 plus million dollars a year. I know it's tied in the production company, so it's hard to nail down a number, uh, but he'll probably get eventually to that Brady number. Um, and so, and it's a production company, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but you look at it, I see why Amazon would want to start that relationship and you see where this could possibly go. For me on that, I, 
it's a, the, the NBA relationship is a happy circumstance. That certainly was within uh, the, their, their mind, but they really want a good alternate programming for Thursday as well. And this is, this is for what makes a good alternate programming, something that brings in other viewers that wouldn't necessarily watch a game. And I think that that potentially is what LeBron can do. So I, I, I agree with everything that you said there. We'll go to who's down, my who's down, new to the who's down list, Luis Silberwasser, the head of Warner Brothers Discovery Sports. Why, Luis? Well, Andrew, did you see how many video subscribers Comcast lost in the third quarter? It, it was so much that Craig Moffat, who uh, works with our uh, guy, Michael Nathanson over at Moffat Nathanson, wrote, and this is the quote, the linear video business is, well, circling the drain. I mean, the numbers are ugly. The rate of decline, it exceeded 10% at Comcast for the first time ever. And so don't cry for Comcast. Comcast is not who's down. Brian Roberts is fine. Broadband's doing well. Wireless is doing well. But this acceleration of cord cutting has to scare executives like Silberwasser much more than other uh, big, big, big media executives. Jimmy Pitaro has ABC. Sean McManus has CBS. Uh, Pete Pavacqua has NBC. They have dedicated broadcast uh, networks that are widely distributed free uh, over the air uh, television. Silberwasser, he he has a a suite of cable channels. Uh, We're going to see how much this decline is going to be affecting them as, as you mentioned earlier with Amazon, the NBA starts to come up. And uh, NBA has a long relationship with with, uh, Turner going back to the 1980s. At what point does this cord cutting trend it's not, when is it not a trend? It's actually happening. When cord yeah, it's cutting, happening. it's not a trend. Yeah, it's, 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 it's beyond it's trend now. Yeah. Beyond uh, the trend. So the, the questions are that we don't know. Where is the, where is the floor? Uh, we're, we're, not, we're not near it yet, it would, it would appear. And um, at what point do these big leagues say, well, boy, uh, uh, cable TV, that's, that's too niche for us to be giving exclusive packages to. Okay. My who's down is Brad Zager executive producer of Fox Sports. Uh, this has been a theme on the podcast. We think announcers, producers, they should be at events. This summer, Fox Sports, for their FS1 games of Major League Baseball, the game of the week, did not send announcers. MLS, they haven't sent announcers. For college football, they've been sending uh, about their top four crews, I believe. Um, they didn't give me the exact number, but uh, two games a week, they're not sending crews. Um, the only reason you can presume it's because of money. So couple of things. Number one, you need to be there because it's the right way to cover games. If you're a big time network, if you want to be considered big time overall, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, it's important for your announcers to, to grow and your producers to grow. They can't do that in a studio. They need to be there. And so it's hard to, to quantify that. Like we can say it and people can be like, eh, whatever. Then we have an issue that they have an FS1 last week. Utah, Washington State game on FS1. There's a two shot they start off with. You can't see it on the podcast, but the two shot, they pretended like they have a green screen behind them and like they're at the game and you can tell they're not. Uh, And they focus on uh, the Utah QB cam rising. And here's Petro Papadakis uh, explaining in the intro uh, what they're looking for from cam rising in the game. And some great play from his trigger man, cam rising the quarterback who has been a great leader for Utah as he goes, this team goes, they're a gritty team, but there's nothing like Thursday night on the Palouse as an equalizer. We'll see if he's up to the task tonight against these Cougs. Then the game starts, and this is what happens when the game starts. And here come the Utes on offense. Cam Rising, who has been outstanding all season long, but last week especially against usc he took his game to another level yeah dynamic personality a great leader a guy who's really handled his business for the Utes over the years this is a football team that wants to establish the run early and rather than cam rising out there to start this game it's the backup bryson barnes so a little bit of trickeration maybe from Coach Whittingham as he's out to throw. All right, that was the play-by-player, Jeff Levering. Uh, and Cam Rising didn't start the game. Uh, and you say, well, whose fault is that? 
Well, it's FS1's fault for not being there. Coach Utah's coach Kyle Whittingham said the announcers weren't there. That's why they didn't know about the information. And so uh, this is the issue, you know, a major issue and a major example of why you have to be there for major events. It says something about your network overall. Look, Fox Sports does a very good job with the major events, the, the Super Bowl, the World Cup. It's going to be on display. But these smaller events, you owe it to your broadcasters. You owe it to your audience. And... Um, they're just as important to those people. Even if it's maybe if you're being County, it doesn't make perfect sense in that moment. This was embarrassing. Yeah. FS1 is not a little channel. It's a national sports channel that, that, that is widely distributed. And this, again, this is a common theme on the pod where we're year, more than a year old now, like send announcers and producers to the events. It makes it, it makes it a better uh, environment to, to watch. And I know they save money by not sending them to, to the events. I refuse to believe that it's that much money. It's not, I mean, you can just figure it out. It's just, it's not, it, it can't be right. You got a light for two people. Uh, and you have uh, a hotel and most of these are smaller college towns. Now they're, they're game weekend. So maybe it's a little bit still, I mean, how, you send them in the night before. Uh, there's get, maybe there's no four seasons in Pullman, Washington. I, yeah. Al Michael is not doing these games. There's not a four seasons <laughs> demand for Jeff Levering. All right. You know, Jeff, maybe one day Jeff Levering can demand four seasons, uh, but uh, he's not Al Michaels yet. So uh, I think Jeff Levering would probably be happy saying, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's Marriott points. So we'll get Levering in a Marriott. But like bottom line is, and I want to make it clear, Jeff Levering um, and Papadakis, they, they didn't do anything wrong. Right. They, they, that's not their fault. They were they're They were not put in position to succeed. So I'm mentioning their names because they were the announcers and we're, we're playing the clips, but it starts with Zager uh, and company thinking that it's okay to produce these games, uh, which just surprises me that, you know, they wouldn't be back out there full fully. Um, and look, obviously the elephant in the room is always COVID, but if you're sending the other crews, right. COVID doesn't go, you know, doesn't just go to like lesser games, right? COVID is, you know, whatever we, you know, we're not getting into COVID and what people think about COVID right now. The point is, is that if you're sending Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt to Michigan uh, games every week, um, then you can send your other announcers as well. So uh, they, they, they need to pick that up if, if you're uh, FS1. All right, John, let's move to the topics. And before we started this podcast, I never thought I'd be so pumped up to talk about the Big 12 and Pac-12 <laughs> rights deals. It's but here fun. We are. Isn't it fun? <laughs> it is fun. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, and I think we have a lot of information. Uh, credit to you and Michael Smith, your partner there at the Sports Business Journal, had the story on Sunday. A uh, six-year deal, $380 million per year for the Big 12, an extension. They have the three years that still are you know, coming up now. No sweetener there. But they stabilize their conference. Uh, and as you said at the top, you know, the, the what I've gotten – feels like a fair deal. Everyone feels like they got a fair deal all the way around. Uh, Big 12 gets stability. ESPN uh, wanted, you know, top, more top games after not, after losing out on the Big 10. Um, and then Fox want, wanted either to be involved with the Big 12 or the Pac-12 going forward to, to have uh, more tonnage and to have more quality games overall. Uh, so they get that. And so uh, those are a few there's, you know, I want to get in the pro rata because I think that's where it gets really interesting, but get, let's get the TV part of it first going. Uh, what are your top thoughts? Yeah. My top thoughts are ESPN uh, with, with uh, the, the top picks uh, that they, they love the fact that they have, you know, the top four picks, eight of the top 12 picks. Uh, and, and they think that this is going to uh, really help out uh, their college offerings um, in, in terms of scheduling. They're, they're just going to have a lot of good games. Um, they, they got uh, the championship game. They have the basketball tournament. And so ESPN deals in tonnage. They got tonnage and they got good games. Um, Fox, you know, they're paying a lot less than ESPN uh, for, for their package. Uh, they don't have the top picks, but they're fine with it. They think that with uh, Oklahoma and Texas leaving the Big 12, there's no like Ohio State, Michigan. That's, ex that's the top pick of the big 10 every year, no matter what. Uh, what, what would it be in the SEC? Auburn, Alabama, I don't know. There, there, yeah. there might be a couple ones there that, that you, but now you just have a bunch of parity and you have a lot of schools that, you know, might be down this year and be up next year and be, be at the top of the, you know, be within the top 10 or top 15. And so they, they feel like given the picks that they have, they're still gonna get quality games 
that they can use on the Fox Broadcast Network, they can use on FS1, and they're uh, basically have a, a plan to flag in the sand where, where they're a major player in college football um, moving forward. Also, Fox got the ba- a lot of basketball games. First time Big 12 basketball, a little underreported part of that deal that I think is going to be significant in, in the winter. Definitely. All right, let's go into like what I think is the most probably interesting going forward because we got a Big 12 versus Pac-12 battle that we've been talking about here for weeks and weeks. Um, And that gets into the pro rata um, information uh, and how that works. So this is what I understand, John, and tell me if you have the same understanding. Uh, In the ESPN part of the deal, if the Big 12 was to bring schools or a school from a power five conference. There's only one conference that you could probably steal from at this point. That would be the PAC 12. So if they were to bring in a PAC 12 team, then that's when the pro rata comes in where they would pay just as much per team. They would add that value to what they're paying now. If you brought in, let's say for example, an Arizona or an Arizona state or Oregon or or whomever um, they would. So, but this is where it gets interesting for my understanding. I don't think Fox, is in alignment with that. And that makes some sense since ESPN is going to be getting the better games. So if they added better teams, that probably would favor ESPN, uh, even though I guess, you know, the long tail would, it would also help Fox a little bit. So the question is, if that were to happen, what happens, you know, and there's a little bit of um, some gray area here and that really affects where college football is going because if they just if you just add a Pac-12 team uh, and you get the same amount of money, then expansion makes a lot of sense um, for the Big 12 and potentially for a Pac-12 school. If you're only going to get, let's say, 63% of that 380 uh, with a new team, so 63% of the 380 added, then uh, you know how does that work? Do you know would would universities thinking we're going to be stronger long term, adding these West Coast schools or a few West Coast schools and take a little less now, thinking you know what that next deal uh, down the road we're going to be really stronger as a conference. So that's what's in play, and then we'll get to the Pac-12 and and what it exactly means for them as well in a moment. Yeah, we have Thought to do that because because right now based on this deal which includes all of the rights. There's been some uh, I've seen on, on the social media about tier three rights. ESPN has all those rights. And, they're, okay, they're- and I want to stop for your second, John, because we do need to explain what tier three rights. I had to educate myself on it, but you know, everyone listening to the podcast is not a Pac-12, Big 12 <laughs> fan. I actually do know, I know the definition now, what tier three rights mean. Go, but take, take, it- take it over. I want to hear oh, you it. you want me to? All right. Yeah, the yeah. Tier, the tier, all right, tell me if I'm wrong. You can, if I'm wrong, go, eh. Maybe you'll get, we'll get a... <laughs> Chris Mason, get the buzzer ready. Get the buzzer ready. Uh, So those are the rights. So if you see like a Big 12 game on your local RSN or or someplace locally, those games are considered part of the tier three rights. I feel like I'm taking like a quiz, like to get into college or something. Uh, and, (laughs) And then all the Olympic sports and all the other sports that aren't on major uh, networks are not football, basically, and basketball, the main games of those games. Um, so where will those end up now? So those tier three rights go to ESPN and they all end up on ESPN plus. Those tier three rights were created when the big 10 launched its own network, the sec launched its own network, PAC 12, uh, ACC started dealing with it. And instead of launching its net, uh, its own network, it said, okay, you have this bucket, bucket of rights and you can do whatever you want with it. And so Texas launched Longhorn uh, Network uh, with it. Oklahoma, they worked with a, a local RSN and they sort of uh, launched their, their own like net, uh, like local network uh, off of it. So these are these are rights, as you said, Olympic rights and sort of the, the worst football game that they have on the schedule. And that's all going to, um, uh, to ESPN Plus. Um, well, how'd I do? Yeah, I thought, I thought well. I thought really well. And like a, Give a solid B plus. A plus. All right. My first A plus of my life. Oh, I said, <laughs> I said oh, B plus. <laughs> B plus. No, I, I, that was I, I'm, a, I'm a tough grader. No, I give that five uh, four point nine six clickers out of five. Oh, wow. Totally. That's a very high yeah. rating. Yeah, that's yeah. a good high rating. If you but, did that, uh, if I did that, if you did that on Twitter, like one of the sportscasters, you get like a text or DM like, oh, where's my point four? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that for? I, I think about it because I know they're going to reach out anyway. All right. So so ultimately, after this deal is done, uh, big 12 schools are going to get right around what 31 million uh, per year from from the me- the media deal. 
I, I can tell you that uh, talking to people at the Pac-12, they think that they consider that a sort of a low low uh, watermark. They they believe that they're going to do a deal and they're going to get a deal done before the end of the year. That's going to be you know it, pr probably within that neighborhood, but a little bit higher than that. So then I, I think that's probably like I said that last week. You know when we talked about this. Um, you know I, I wrote in our New York Post Plus newsletter uh, that it would end this. You know I thought it would go this way um, with the ESPN and Fox going to the Big Twelve and the Pac twelve ending up with Amazon and ESPN. Here's the question though. I think. Uh, I do have, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts when you talk about the Pac-12. So I think if you look at it from a TV network point of view, um, they look at these teams um, in the Pac-12 as compared to the Big 12 on an individual basis being worth similar amount, if not maybe even a little bit more for these 10 Pac-12 schools, right? So a little bit more. So if they were to get the same amount per year, that makes sense. The question I have for you, is I don't think ESPN nor Amazon really wants a second package of the Pac-12. I think they both want the A package. Now, could they have a A, you know, one and one A? Maybe that could work. Um, but I don't see either of them breaking the bank. You know, ESPN now has uh, the Big 12 uh, done. It also has, you know, this pro rata thing where if they don't do a deal with the Pac-12, then, you know, I'm not saying that they would do this. I know ESPN says they're not involved at all. And, you know, Fox with UCLA and USC. But, I mean, there's nothing that stops them from saying, all right, let's go get a couple of Pac-12 schools for the Big 12 if we don't have the Pac-12, right? Like, we'll put some more money into it. I'm not saying they're doing that. I'm not, and I'm not saying that's happening. I'm just kind of thinking out loud of what could happen. And then Amazon, I've said this before, I don't think they're just going to look at the market and say, well, what's our competition? We don't think CBS is involved. We don't think NBC is involved. Um, Turner Sports. Uh, they're w, long, what are we? They're a long shot. They've been talking to them, but they're they're a long shot. Wait, WBD Sports. I get it right? <laughs> WBD Sports. Warner Brothers Discovery. Yes. There we go. Warner. So Turner's parent company. You know, could they get involved? Apple. Really, no indication. They're quiet Apple, but no indication that Apple's involved. I mean, they could be their wallet card. But still, are they going to break the bank when there's not leverage? And then Fox, I don't think is totally out on the Pac-12. But if, if the Pac-12 is doing a deal with Fox, it's probably bad news because Fox is not going to overpay for the Pac-12. That means they have to turn back. The, they're not going to be bidding anybody up. If they come back to them and there's a good deal, I think I could see Fox and the Pac-12 maybe getting back together. I think there's bad blood. I don't see that. So that's the issue uh, for the Pac-12. Now, could it work where they had similar money and they can keep that conference together? I think that's very possible, uh, but you're probably going to be on a streamer, which I'm not positive works on college football, or at least not the top, top SEC Big Ten college football. Um, when you're talking about the Pac-12, I'm not sure if you end up with the same thing as you had with the Pac-12 network, where you're kind of out of sight, out of mind a little bit. What, what's so funny about this is the Big Ten does its deal and the Pac-12 is like, OK, that sets the market. And the, the networks are like, that didn't set the market at all. And so now the Big 12 did, did the deal and the networks are like, that set the market. And the Pac-12 is like, that didn't set the market at all. So they're going to meet somewhere. I do think that. But, what, but you you think they will? Because I just I, 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 I'm, I'm much more positive about the Pac-12's uh, future than, than it sounds like you are. Well, no, I've said I've said that I think they can get similar money and and similar money I doesn't gonna, mean I think they're going to I think they're going to. Well, well, it's it's remember, it's just 10 Pac-12. That's what Pac I mean. So it means like 300, 310. That's similar money for them. They need to get three, 310 or so. Um, not You know, do the math in your head. I know that ESPN wants a power five. They, they, they don't want sort of a power four that might turn into just like two conferences. They they want one a power five. I believe that Fox, even though they're not as invested in the Pac-12 right now, they also want a, a, a good substantial power five, which is, you know, the, the SEC and the, and, and the Big Ten and then three conferences in the ACC, the Big 12 and the Pac-12 that, that, that are right there. And, 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 uh, and so will that. I, I think that they'll pay for that because uh, I don't think that these these payments are are outrageous um, uh, uh, out there. What will cause though a Pac-12 school to uh, to because the Big 12 wants to expand? They've they've been playing. Yes. Uh, they've been totally upfront about that. What will cause a Pac-12 school to leave the Pac-12 and, and, and go to the Big 12 if if they're getting similar money? 
Well, you said this two things. Number one, this is and this is really important to me. Okay, and I think this is always what you have to think about when you sign one contract. You have to have in mind the next contract. So, you know, could the Big Twelve schools say, "All right, you know what? We're only going to get more money from ESPN, maybe not from Fox here, but would it be worth it to spread out the money a little bit more, make a little bit less now, and I we bring in if it's Arizona, Arizona State, or Oregon, or whomever it is, because long term we're going to be stronger because we're going to have that larger footprint, and we'll take a little bit tiny step back because you're only adding one or two teams, uh, and it really puts pressure then on the on the Pac-12. Does that make sense? Um, if you're overall the Big 12 for that next contract, all of a sudden you're stronger. You have, you know, West Coast uh, footprint. And now, you know, Brett Yarmark has talked about being a, being a national conference. That's just something I think you have to keep in mind. And again, if you're the Pac-12 and you're only 10 teams, it's just, you know, that you, you see this happen. If one team leaves, it's very, it's just with 10 teams, you're in a very uh, tough situation. Now, I don't think the Big Ten, I think that the money is dried up there. The idea that, you know, Kevin Warren had, the commissioner of the Big Ten at first to keep building and building. We talked about it early on the podcast. There's just not that money to divvy up. There's not adding more money to these deals if uh, you're Fox, NBC, or CBS. They're happy with how it is. You know, you add Notre Dame, sure. But these other schools, they're not worth the same amount to them as what they're paying now. And so, that's where it gets a little bit dicey to me if you're a small conference of only 10 teams. And here, let me then last thing, and then I think we should move on to the next topic is that, um, for me at least, is that uh, the pro rata only go to a power five conference team. So they can't just add any team and get the same amount of money added. So that's very important. And that's, I think, different than maybe past contracts. Uh, so that's important. And here's one more, more TV related. Everything in the ESPN deal is direct to consumer, can be transferred to direct to consumer. So just go adding to our um, big theme about how ESPN is going to go direct to consumer, uh, you know, relatively in the near future. To wrap this up, uh, uh, what I'm expecting to see, um, you've heard the same thing. Amazon, ESPN, they're the front runners. Uh, I think it's most likely they're going to split a package 50 50 or, or how, however that that looks. I expect a deal in place uh, by Thanksgiving uh, uh, with, with a handshake. Uh, the things will be signed maybe early next year. But I think that Pac-12 is fine. They're going to have a, 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 their schools are going to have a, a more money coming in per school than the uh, Big 12 Um uh, I don't know about the ACC yet, but but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see on that. Uh, probably not as much as the ACC, but uh, I, I think they're they're going to get a, a, a deal that's going to work well, and it's going to be a good Power Five until the SEC and the Big Ten decide that they want to expand. Which I don't know if they will, considering the money. I don't know if people are just adding more money, depending on, again, a couple of schools could make it so you add more money. All right, so let's go to uh, topic two, which is the rest of the, the rest of the show, quick hits. Uh, you broke a story, Andrew, this week about Amazon getting into talk shows. I got to say, I'm scratching my head. Everything Amazon does, how are they going to make money off of this? What do you know? Well, to answer your question, they think they'll make it off of advertising, uh, number one. Uh, they So let me just give you a little background on what it is. Uh, they're going to have their, their creative title. Uh, it's called Sports Talk. Um, and so it's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, most of the people are not very well known. So what I think, you know, they're what they're doing is trying something out. You know, if it wasn't Amazon, right, uh, I, we're not I'm not writing about it. Right. It's Amazon. Uh, they're a monster. They got Thursday night football. They've been in on all these college rights. They're 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 up and coming um, insurgent and important. So when they do anything now, it's kind of, you know, in that ESPN, Fox, NBC, CBS, uh, you know, because it's Amazon. Uh, is this a, a exciting move? I mean, I think the biggest name that they're working with is the producer, Michael Davies uh, from Men in Blazers, who's also the executive producer of Jeopardy and started uh, Embassy Row. Um, and he, uh, he's he been really good. I mean, we, uh you know, in the interview in a moment, Peter Traeger mentioned he, he's the one who came up with the good morning football idea. So he's really good at this stuff. So I think when you look at the list of names, and I did joke to somebody like, did you make up half these names uh, to somebody at Amazon? I said, like, who are these people? But some of them, Carrie Champion used to be on ESPN. And there's some others I, I definitely knew. Uh, Madeline Burke's here locally. Um, Master T 
uh, I know from Twitter. I think you look at it. I think you might there might be some stars that come out of this, but does it work? I don't know. You know, I think that's where the streaming aspect of things is different than what we're used to with broadcast and cable, where you just flip on ESPN, what's on. And I don't know if you have that unless you somehow produce a hit and maybe maybe they'll produce one hit. I mean, that's to me, if you're them, that's the goal. And then you go from there. But they're kind of I, I wrote in the story, they're money balling it. It's not like this big expenditure. They didn't go get Pat McAfee. They didn't go get Stephen A. They got some people who, um, you know, it's a. They're, I'm sure they're making pretty fine money, um, but uh, it's more of a uh, let's see what if this can work and then go from there. But it's Amazon. Over under, over under. You seen Fox Sports uh, studio shows and, 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 and the, the, their their viewership? Will this get as much as that or less than that? Those studio shows are five figures in terms. Yeah, of- those uh, I'll say less, at least, you know, for the next year or two. Uh, I will also say that the Amazon approach is global. So they're going to talk about more than American sports. And so, you know, that's the thing with digital. You can reach anybody in the world. Uh, you have to actually reach them. You got to have something, you know, you have to have something of interest and maybe they will. Like, again, I don't, a lot of these people aren't as well known. So, you know, you got to give them a chance and and see if they can find an audience. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's worth a try. And I, I, if I were them, if I'm Amazon, I don't do the uh, uh, big money thing. All right, let's go on. Uh, NWSL championship game was on CBS. On Saturday, we talked about it last week. I'm very bullish on women's sports doing real well and being a financial uh, gain situation for networks and and platforms. Uh, what says you about it? Here in D.C., Audi Field, uh, we, we had the muckety mucks from uh, CBS coming down. Uh, there, there was uh, Dan Weinberg was down here. Jen Sabatel was down here. Look, we, we, we've been talking about the, this game and it was on Saturday night. I wasn't expecting a lot in terms of viewership. It got about a million viewers, which I thought is, was, was pretty good. That's for a good it. number. Going against the World Series, going against big time co- college football. And if you think this is a ceiling for them, then sell. But I think that we're at the beginning part of the TV networks trying to figure out the audiences ar- around women's sports. And I see a huge growth potential for them uh, based on based on that performance. Yeah, and if it was on Paramount Plus, you know, we wouldn't get the numbers, but how many people would have watched? You know, like the... 50,000, 100,000. It was on CBS in the middle of the afternoon, as it was last year, uh, then it would have gotten about half the audience. Exactly. So a big win to me, because you have to, again, you have to get people to actually know about it. Um, I'm going to tell Jen Sepatel is the head of CBS's sports is PR. I'm going to tell her official title now is Muckety Muck. Muckety Muck. Her and Weinberg. But Dan Weinberg, senior vice president, who has a son at Maryland, by the way. So he's a he should be he should be my who's up, Dan Weinberg. He's a senior VP of Muckety Muck. All right. Last <laughs> thing before we get to Schrager, Mando live. Mando is the name of the podcast behind the scenes, Marshand and Orand uh, sports media podcast. So if you want to impress your kids with some cool lingo, call it the Mando pod. Um, so uh we're going to be live. What are we doing here? It's going to be our, our first live show, Andrew. I, I, I'm a little bit nervous about it. At the, at the end of the month, it's going to be November 30th in New York at uh, Sports Business Journal's Media Innovators uh, Conference. Uh, we're going to uh, go on stage and do the just do our regular show. It's going to be who's up, who's down. We have to talk about whether or not we're going to get a big get or not. Uh, Jimmy Bataro is going to be speaking at the conference. We're going to get a lot of the people, a lot of the big executives uh, running, um, uh, 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 you know, sports media at, at the conference. But I'm excited on stage with Andrew, Andrew Marchand. You know, I, I think it'll it'll uh, it, it'll be a fun one. It'll be good. It'll be good. You know, what I want I want Chris Ripley, Sinclair. If you're listening, Chris Ripley, the head of Sinclair, I would like him on our podcast because i think it's only fair i mean we'll be we'll be nice i'll keep okay. john away from Saint, sinclair is going to be at the event for a one-on-one on stage with me and we don't know yet if it's going to be a uh chris ripley or not he needs to come on the pie i don't know the man like honestly god he's like, good he's very he's very polished he has a you know it's not a like, picture ones I, I again before we started this podcast i would not know who chris ripley was uh, thank God for you, John. Um, but now Chris Ripley is a big part of my oh, wait, life. Th- th- this has been my funnest podcast. You talk about how fun these rights deals are for, you know, little college conferences out West. Chris Ripley of Sinclair. I, I-, I love it. I need a breaking news sounder. Oh, just in. This is our lowest rated podcast ever. <laughs> Thanks, Schrager. Thank you. No, not because of Schrager. No, no. I know. Right, let's get yeah. to Schrager. <laughs> 
John joining us now, the big get, Peter Schrager. Let's go over his resume, John. A Schrager is get. the host of the Emmy Award winning Good Morning Football it's on NFL Network. He's also the host of the Season with Peter Schrager podcast. He's got great guest uh, head coaches like Robert Sala, uh, actors Paul Rudd. He had Ken Dorsey after uh, his big uh, you know, iPad episode <laughs> in the, uh, in the uh, Bills uh, coaching office um during that what, what game was that peter i forgot that was their loss to the dolphins Got yeah, to get kenny, went, kenny dorsey on to explain himself he was great yeah it's kenny dorsey also of course fox sports insider uh sideline reporter for fox uh does it all and here's the thing john about peter schrager now we love sports media i think just watching peter schrager's twitter watching his social i think he's a guy who one day if his career goes right could maybe even cover sports media Everyone wants to cover sports media. Absolutely. Hashtag everyone wants to cover sports media. If there is a Sinclair RSN rating that I can share before you guys, <laughs> I would love it. Um, if I know Adam Amin's future when his contract is up, I would love to tweet it out. I mean, you guys, I love this podcast. I also love the fact that uh, I've been reading, you know, both of you guys forever, but John, I go back to getting the, I mean, I was not paid for by a company, paid for by me getting the old glossy SBJ, getting it, you know, once every two weeks, getting it, going through it and loving it all there. So it's cool to be on with you guys. So we just want to know the Cliff Notes version, how you got from Emory uh, to where you are now, uh, NFL Network, Fox, we just named it all uh, and big name in the business. How did you go from there to here? Yeah, no, it's uh, it was a circuitous route. It was not from Newhouse or from Medill. It was uh, writing for the Emory School paper and doing radio and doing TV and emailing just about everybody in the world to see if I can get a lunch or an internship or anything. And fortunately, uh, ESPN.com gave me that first opportunity back when they had something called page three. So there was page one, there was page two with like Simmons and Ralph Wiley and those guys. And then there was page three, which is pop culture and sports made my uh, imprint there and then moved over to foxsports.com. And I have been uh, affiliated with Fox since 2006 in some way, starting as a freelance sports writer uh, and then made the move to, to do in sidelines. And then Fox sports one was an opportunity that I made the most out of. And then of course now, um, being in the, the Fox studio every Sunday on the Fox NFL kickoff show, but uh, wrote, a, wrote a few books along the way, have uh, worked on Inside the NFL along the way. And the truth of it is uh, making the most out of every single opportunity and not burning a single bridge along the way. You're definitely a connector. I mean, John, I got one of his emails and I'm not that much older than him, but I was like covering the Mets. He must've just said, oh, I'm just going to email anybody in media. Mm. And I got on this list. I think I deleted it. No, I'm not kidding. I, I responded. I think I responded, but, but I was like, I didn't, we just, we corresponded shortly and then we lost touch. Um, Cause I was like, this guy can't do anything. No, no, that yeah, no I, I couldn't help you. You know, yeah. you know, what's funny about that. I didn't get one of those emails, no. but I, I was at a Fox party <laughs> and Lou Dermilio was like, some dude here wants to meet you. I was like, meet <laughs> me for what? <laughs> like, do I owe money? <laughs> it, was, it was Schrager. And I've, I've followed your career ever since then. I like root for you now. I know guys, like, honestly, I, I consume and I read and I read and I like, this is all I ever wanted to do. I think it was an interesting um, story that Bill Burr, the comedian of all people, was telling recently about Keith Richards. They asked Keith Richards, like, why do you still do it? And he's like, because I still like the smell of when I open that guitar case. And I've always wanted to do this. Like, I am literally living uh, in my dream and what I want to do if you told me as a five-year-old, as a 10-year-old, as a 15-year-old. So guys like you, of course, but I mean, I, I would, you know, Jim Nance was a Colts Neck, New Jersey native. And I, I read his book and I thought it really sung to me. It was about him and his father and his story. And I you know, on the back of it, it's like Jim Nance's email. So I sent him an email. I was 20 something years old and like Nance wrote back and that's a relationship I've had for 20 years now. And at, to any young broadcaster who's reached out to me, I always respond because I feel like it, that goes such a long way. And it's such an easy thing to do to just have an open mind and kind of give back because there were so many people who didn't respond to those emails and didn't want to meet me. But, you know, I, all along I've, I've had a, a dream and a vision and there's been a lot of cool people to open the doors along the way. For the record, I did respond, John. I don't, you know, I think I did. Man. I had no advice for him. I was probably like emailing you about like Ray Ordonez. Or yeah, something. exactly. Yeah, it was something like that. <laughs> but I, but your name stuck out and then I watched it go. And then all of a sudden uh, I wasn't covering this. Should the Mets ever... trade for John Vanderwall? Like Andrew, what do you think? <laughs> Important stuff. So, uh, so uh, Peter, your, your main gig now is pretty much good. Good morning football. Uh, 
which years ago, uh, you know, your boy Reith Miller gave me the scoop. I, I was one that I, I broke that story that the NFL Network had this new morning show. And if you uh, put a gun to my head, I would have given you six months. Like, yeah. I, I just like, I, it didn't sound like- You and me both. <laughs> I, when did you realize that this was something that was that was really going to last? Well, it was a, it was a totally uh, upside down idea because the guy who created it is guy Michael Davies, who runs a company, NBC Row. You know, might know Michael Davies from Men in Blazers. He's the British one, or one of the two British ones. Um, and Michael basically approached me because I'd done a bunch of stuff on Fox Sports 1. And he's like, well, I have this new idea for a show where it's going to be asymmetric. It's not like any sports morning show. Um, and we're going to put four people together and it's going to be like The View, which you see, but it's just football and it's not heavy on highlights and it's, not, and it's just conversation. And he's like, and we're getting together four people. And he tells me this in like mid July. And he's like, and we want you to be, you know, one of the four people. And I'm like, wow, I don't have to audition. Don't have to audition. Okay. Let me ask for permission for Fox. Like we're looking at this for next season. And he's like, no, we're thinking about it in two weeks. I'm like, two weeks? Yeah, the start of training camp. And the other four people, the other three people, well, it's Kyle Brandt, who I knew was a booker on Jim Rome's show, who would, you know, book me as a guy. I'm like, I like Kyle. I've met him a few times. Sure. Okay. Don't know what, what, okay. Uh, Kay Adams never had heard of her, but I, you know, I was like, all right, great. Sounds interesting. You know, she does fantasy football. She works in Boston, does NBC. Then Nate Burleson, who I had covered as a player and we, did, I worked on Inside the NFL and on Inside the NFL, we'd bring in Nate and Pete Radovich was the producer and Pete loved Nate. We'd bring him in and he was outstanding. And I remember calling Nate and I'm like, are you really moving from Arizona to do this job on the NFL network where we're waking up at four? Like, if you're in, I'm in. And like Nate's like, I think I'm in. Are you in? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm in. It's like, we all kind of like just went for it. And I knew it was taking off and like a couple months in, you know, Aikman and Buck were talking about it on the broadcast and Collinsworth and Michaels were like mentioning good morning football and not in a... Oh, we have to read the read for Good Morning Football, but in a, there was a good point made on Good Morning Football and people started to recognize the show around the league because truly our show's greatest strength. It's, it's never going to get the ratings of Get Up. It's never going to have the widespread audience where I can't walk through an airport like I'm, you know, uh, Al Michaels or, or Tariq or anybody. It's, it's the guys and gals within those buildings. So within those 32 buildings, our show is on six hours a day. It's on from seven to 10 and then from 10 to one, it's in the locker room. It's, it's in the coach's office. So we have a platform. I would almost say we're like the trade publication of the NFL. And uh, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of candid uh, conversations that are had. And there's a lot of candid responses from those buildings based on what we say. So we know that there's a great power in that, in the platform. Yeah. 32 buildings. It's thir 33 buildings. If you include Park Avenue where That's the NFL uh, offices are. Like, and, and that's the unique part about that show is that the quality of the people that are watching. It's the people that are running the league. What, when did you start to notice that that was a part of uh, your audience there? Yeah, I'll give a good quick story. Um, this was the first year we had a show and Cam Newton was the quarterback for the Carolina Panthers. And on a Sunday night, he decided not to wear a tie on the team bus or the team plane and Ron Rivera benched him. And Derek Anderson, the longtime backup was given the start. And on the first pass, Derek Anderson throws a pick six and the Seahawks blow out the Panthers. And I come on with bluster the next morning. I'm going to put on my talking head uh, outfit. I'm going to be Stephen A or I'm going to be Skip Bayless. And I come out there with fire and I'm like, Ron Rivera should, should own that loss. That's on Ron Rivera. Ron Rivera has a problem with how Cam Newton's dressed. Cam Newton's done enough in this league to wear whatever the hell he wants. And Cam Newton is the guy. How can you bench him? That sacrifice is a... And in the commercial break, my phone rings and it's uh, the PR guy from the Carolina Panthers. Great dude named Stephen Drummond. And he's like, uh, dude, you, 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 a little, you went over the let and I'm like, okay, like, is everything all right? He's like, yeah. And then Brandon Bean, who's now the GM of the Buffalo bills and executive of the year was number two in Carolina at the time. And he calls me and he's like, you really ought to call Ron. So I'm like, ah, oh, shit. All right. So I call, I get the number to Ron Rivera and I'm like, and, he, and Ron Rivera's point was basically like, Hey, dude, if you've got a take or if you've got a thought, or you got insight why don't you reach out to me first and we can talk it out before you go on air and you blast your big hot take so I can at least get you the facts right. If you, if, if you believe it and you're authentic, that's great, but get the facts right and talk to me first if you want, if you're going to come at me like that. So Rivera and I, it was a very awkward, tense thing. Sure enough, because I was wearing both hats, I go and do Carolina Panthers, Atlanta Falcons sideline reporting the very next week and I got to look Rivera in the face and it was the best thing that could have happened because I learned a key lesson, but I also learned that, hey, everyone's listening and whether it be Odell Beckham and we're suggesting where he should sign and he responds to the show, whether it be Roger Goodell or whether it be the fan on the couch 
who has a, you know, a passionate take about his team and you thought you were a little too dismissive or demeaning about the fan base, everybody's watching and, you know, the words actually carry weight now. Yeah, and I think that might be instructive of a feeling of how you do your job because you're an insider, but you're not really playing, it seems to me, in the schefter Rappaport game of getting each transaction and kind of tweeting out every little thing. And the thing I like about it, and you know, and there's a place for that, you know, for, for those guys. Like I I think those guys uh I think it's misunderstood largely what they do a lot of times. Now I've hit Schefter especially a few times over a couple of things, but but overall there's a role for that. But what I like about what you do is I want to know like before things happen. I want to know what people are thinking. So in terms of doing your job and having opinion and being watched, you still have to be interesting, even Mm -hmm. if you have the information. How do you go about doing things so you're an insider, but you're not necessarily, you've broken some stories, don't get me wrong, but but you're trying to tell us what's going on and what could be happening. Well, it's funny you say that because I think my greatest strength as the insider is around NFL draft season. I'll nail my mock draft just about every year and it's got a lot of great uh, readers and credibility to it because people know that my stuff's legit. I'm not throwing stuff on a wall. This isn't what I think. This isn't what I think the Jets should do. This is what I'm hearing from the Jets brass. So people take that into account. Um, I respect the hell out of what all those guys do. It was early on in my career when I would start getting sent to events though, like uh, the senior bowl or the combine. And I would see all the sports writers just hanging out together and having dinner together. And I was thinking, gosh, Fox is paying me to be at this event. I know it's not to talk to the, the, you know, the Washington beat reporter from the Washington Post. I know it's not to just hang with all the other Jets beat reporters. I better make the most out of this. And I would always go out of my way to start, you know, like you guys were laughing about earlier, like the blind email, but I'll go back to the senior bowl, probably 2011. We're there and I'm in Mobile, Alabama for five days, you know, and it's cold, it's January and you've got all these young coaches there. And I remember looking at like the org chart of like the Washington at the time, it was the Redskins and they had a 27 year old tight ends coach who was right up there and it was Sean McVay. And I reached out to him over email, like sean.mcvay at redskins.com, whatever it was like, Hey, we're similar ages. I'm going to be in Mobile. Would love to grab a coffee, never a drink. Let's not get, you know, we're not going to get messed up. Like, let's have a coffee, like adults, um, introduce myself. And you would be shocked at the amount of people who, res- who respond to that. McVeigh was one of them. And we've become great friends, but also he helps inform me on things. So the Rams, as they're these players with, with free agency, and of course, you know, always going for it and F those picks and all this thing, I'm always a step ahead because I'll talk to McVeigh going into it. And when I say, hey, the Rams are looking to make a move, you better believe the Rams are looking to make a move. And when I say the Rams aren't interested in this guy, I think it's the way to gold because people know where it's usually coming from. It's conversations there. Um, but time and time again, it was just trying to create a relationship saying, and more than anything, hey, I'm here. If you ever want to have a conversation about anything, bounce an idea off me. And over the years, I've I've built real relationships. These aren't transactional relationships. I, I respect the hell out of Ian, Adam. And I think, you know, guys like Glaze, all these guys are, are fantastic at what they do. And a lot of what they do is building relationships on their end. Mine is more, hey, morning before it happens, or even better sometimes, guys, is 24 after hours after, how'd it go down? And 7 a.m. starts, it's, wow, the 49ers got McCaffrey. Schrager, what do you got? Oh, well, I was on the phone with the decision makers on both sides at 11 o'clock at night last night during the Thursday night game. I'm the first one to speak in the morning, 7 a.m. Here's what I got. Here's how it went down. It was actually a bidding war between the Niners and the Rams. And, you know, the viewers love that stuff. Take us yeah, in the room. Take us in it. Uh, my Twitter feed is one thing. You can get the transactions anywhere and you can get the injury reports and all that stuff. I love telling the stories of how things got, uh, got done. And I think my employers appreciate that aspect of it too. So what, what's your day like? I mean, you, you build up these relationships. How do you maintain these relationships? Sounds like you're, you're texting or on the phone uh, from morning to night. Great question. So my day starts at- Thank you for the great, I got the great question. That was great because- You I have think- not got, Andrew, I just want to say, Andrew Marchand has not gotten one great question. Because yeah, I'm going to ask interview. the hard questions. I'm about to drill him. I'm not looking for his- a, a, he he just, right, he right. just, John, give me softballs. Thank you, Peter. Those I appreciate that. Give me the softballs. I like those. Let me talk about myself. Um, <laughs> great question is not, a, it's, let's face yeah. it, great question question is not necessarily a compliment no great question means i get to talk about myself more i like yeah, that exactly. um, <laughs> and my it's rise hard to, to get you to do that it feels like in my rise to stardom um yeah <laughs> truthfully though i'm up at 4 30 in the morning on the east coast every morning and i you know i live in the city which helps so i can just get it doesn't take an hour to get to the office we work in lower manhattan i live in brooklyn it takes about 15 minutes but i'm on the phone then and you'd be surprised even some of the west coast coaches are up 
it's crazy. So those hours, I could write a book on these morning hours from like 4.30 to 6 a.m. All the East Coast coaches are up and they're usually in their office and they're getting their day started because they can get their work done before the players come in. And that's just where the conversations start. A lot of times on Monday mornings, it's give me your one big takeaway from yesterday's win or loss. And a lot of times, you know, going into the weekend with Fox, it's, you know, what do I need to know? What's the, who, who's the captain who spoke up this week? Or who's the player that, you know, you think steps up in the game plan on a Thursday night game? All that stuff happens then. Um, and then I'm at Good Morning Football, you know, from about 5 a.m. to about 11 a.m. And then the rest of the day is building the show the next morning. We're three hours show and uh, the four hosts take, take a very big role in the segments, but also in the conversations we're going to have. So it's a constant dialogue. Now, we know you want to cover sports media. Let's face it. You would love to, to do this podcast. So let's just put your sports media cap on for a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote about Sean McVay in the off season about the possibility of going to Amazon. They were prepared to offer him $20 million uh, per year in that neighborhood. Uh, never got to a meeting. He, he re-upped or agreed with the Rams at that point before. When do you think Sean McVay makes the jump to broadcasting? Hmm. I think uh, I'll never forget texting him the photo of the New York Post back page on your article, which was, it was like the pinnacle of sports media when all these things were happening and Buck was leaving and Aikman was leaving and McVay was being talked about and Herb Street and all these guys. And Al Michaels and I sent him the picture on the back of the New York Post and he just gave like the smiley face emoji like this is so absurd that like in New York City, Sean McVay's sports media future is on the cover of the New York Post. Um, I think he'll do it eventually. You know, we did a podcast together. We co-hosted it last summer called Flying Coach. And it was for Bill Simmons and The Ringer. And we did 10 episodes and it was two hours each and it was we would interview other coaches and Sean loved it like loved it he could be himself and he wasn't him at a post conf, you know post game press conference and we really got a kick out of it but it he still has that burning desire to coach even they lose to San Francisco on you know Sunday of this week as we're recording this and we spoke yesterday after the game and he's like, this is actually a cool opportunity for me because now I can lead from behind like I, we've never had the opportunity where we're two games under 500 and like this is a different toolbox tool in the toolbox for me and like how how good can we be and I gosh to come from behind is so cool so I think he still has that hunger and that burning desire to lead and I think he's got a loyalty to Stafford and those guys I would say if Stafford and Donald and Cup and those guys start to either you know say farewell or all that stuff I think I could see him exploring a career in broadcasting you know when those guys decide to hang it up. John Schrager is a New York guy. I know he's a Franciscan Russo guy. So we got to do a little over under. Uh, yeah. If the over under is three years on Sean McVay, you taking the over or the under? Great question. Oh, oh my God, you get that so, so that on every it. time. Because Andrew, three because, years, I don't know. Because his contract, I think, with the Rams extends beyond three years. So I would say, uh, I, I would like, okay, I'm going to say, I'd like to see how this season finishes up and what Stafford and the rest of the guys, the veterans, Stafford and Donald primarily, what they end up doing. I think that's fair. I think that gives you guys an indication of not only where his head is at, but where my head is at looking at. Now, the question is, were all those seats filled? Is Amazon is Amazon thrilled with Herb Street? Does Fox go to Tom Brady? We know Collinsworth is, is, you know, is a made man, all that stuff. Like all those things have to happen. I will say this. Um, you know, Sean did it for flying coach with me. He did a Super Bowl on the uh, on ESPN one year and like still talks about how much he loved working with like Susie Colbert on like Super Bowl Sunday and breaking down film like he will be a superstar when he decides to do this. All right. So everybody wants to cover sports media, Peter. I identify the current NFL player, not the obvious ones, not the Brady's Ooh. or the Aaron Rodgers, who is uh, going to be who has a future on TV. I think Travis Kelsey was going to be really good. I think he comes off as like a little Gronkish where he's like goofy, but like I've been in production meetings with Kelsey and he's smart. He's insightful. I know that we have a lot of tight ends on TV, whether it be Shannon Sharp or whether it be obviously Gronk did his cup of coffee and Tony Gonzalez, but I think Greg Travis Olson. Kelsey, Greg Olson, of course. Um, I think he's really good. And I would look at some of these other, like, you know, the quarterbacks that came out recently, like Fitzpatrick and Sanchez, like those guys are good. And Chase Daniel does stuff for NFL Network. Those guys are good. I would look at those types. I'll give you a name. I think Colt McCoy, who's currently backing up Kyler Murray with the Arizona Cardinals. I've had a million conversations with Colt uh, 
we've been at social events together. Like that guy tells stories and maybe it be, maybe it's college football, not NFL, but like a guy like Colt McCoy, who's been in so many locker rooms and has been around so many players and so many coaches that can just open the bag and tell stories. I think that's what we like. Now, Kay Adams left Good Morning Football um, and Nate Burleson, you mentioned him earlier, by the way, was that a good decision for Nate to go from Arizona and New Jersey? Did that work out for him or no? I think it worked out pretty well if he wanted a post <laughs> uh, playing career. Although uh, we laugh about it. I text Nate. I'm like, what are your thoughts on Fetterman versus Oz? And Nate, he's now doing like the CBS morning news talking about Ukraine. And I'm like, I'm busy over here talking about Christian McCaffrey's touches. How are you doing, Nate? Um, but he's been awesome at what he's, he's done. Nate, yeah, but, he's but the transition, it. you guys have been in transition. It is the show NFL, like the NFL watches and, and other people too. Don't sell yourself short yeah. as if like it's only those like 32 offices are watching it. This show, of course, NFL Network as compared to ESPN and maybe even to FS1 doesn't have the reach um, in terms of, you know, people just turning to it in the morning, but it, it reaches a lot of people. But just the transition for, for your show, uh, post Kay Adams, post Nate uh, Burleson, what, what have you seen? What, what do you think? It's been invigorating for for all of us producers and Kyle as well. It, it, you know, the show's been on for for six years now. We won the Emmy for best daily show, which blew us away. Um, and then it was like, all right, how do you how, how do you stay at it? How do you keep it going? How do you make it go? You know, Kay is pursuing other opportunities, so we had this open seat. And Jamie Erdahl comes in and I'd never met Jamie. And then Ian Eagle calls me like in the middle of the summer. He's like, I hear Jamie might be a possibility. He's like, she's amazing. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, she's amazing. And then another colleague of hers at CBS called me, a producer and was like, uh, if Jamie's really considering that, like you guys are going to be very, very happy with that. And I was like, all right, we met Jamie and I, and like, immediately the, the conversation goes to like Tua Tunga Vailo and she's like oh I've covered 11 of Tua's games because I was the sideline reporter for CBS all those years I know Joe Burrow on a personal level Jalen Hurts is someone I covered like Jamie is so well versed in these in these players from the college game and then so well prepared uh she's been fantastic and then McCordy, it's like I, we, we had so many different former players come and fill in Nate's role last year and they all brought different things to the table and then you know, McCourty was selected based on a performance at the broadcast boot camp, which is they take about 30 current players, plop them in LA for a week, and they get to meet all the executives. And McCourty stood out. He comes on our show and like, could you find anyone more relevant than a guy who's played 13 years in the league, has been a captain on those teams, and his brother's on the Patriots. He's played for Belichick. He's with Tua last year in Miami. And like, so down to earth and so good and really funny. Like, Kyle and I are having a blast right now. And I, I couldn't say enough about the current version of the show. I think uh, we're in a really good place. And I love my new two co-hosts. Yeah, McCordy's been good on the Westwood One doing radio. I wonder it if- does radio on the games out of the gate. Like you're one and it's really good. He's really good. Like he, he, he does a good job. I could see uh, you know, TV network execs. I need somebody I'd look for if he wanted want wants to. Hey, hey slow down, slow down. We've already <laughs> been poached enough. It's funny. Like there's producers who have worked on our show for a week and they throw Good Morning Football on the resume and now they're like running their own shows all over like all of sports media and I'm like, okay, we've got a nice little tree here, but uh, we'd like to keep some some folks here. You know? well, what's next for you? Yeah, what's, what's the next future for, you? for Peter Schrager? Um, I'll be honest. I'm I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing and I. I I don't have this like outsized ambition to take over the world. I think it's a really good time to be involved with the NFL. I've got a great platform and I work on two top shows. Like, I don't know if you guys watch it, the Fox NFL kickoff show. It's the one before the pregame. Like, I'm really proud of that show. I, I fly in every week from New York to LA. Like we had a great thing going like Sean Payton and Carissa and Charles Woodson and Vic. Like we have, we have a lot of pride in that show. I'm on two great shows and I really enjoy it. And now I'm doing this podcast with the NFL, which is like, all right, it's iHeartMedia, but it's also the NFL. So I've got the NFL's, I call it like a, like a, like a I guess like almost like a fountain, like, cause they could just tweet out with their 4 million followers. Here's a clip from Schrager's podcast and it gets traction. Um, I'm doing a lot. I'm happy. It's great. I, you know, the only thing I miss is the writing. Like I used to write books. I used to write a lot of articles and just the bandwidth isn't there necessarily anymore, but um, I don't know. We'll see what happens down the road. I mean, I've, I've got, two really good employers right now. We'll see if there's other opportunities that come along the way. How about sleep? Not, not for now. I'm got to, got to earn. I live in New York city. Got to earn. I've got to make it happen. I like what I do. Like, honestly, but, like, like, seriously, but I'm always curious about this because I do think people 
kind of realize probably at some level, but doing those morning shows, you got to be committed because it kicks your ass. Yeah, because a lot of people who are listening probably wake up early, but there's a difference between waking up early and having to be on as opposed to waking up really early, working out or drinking coffee or getting eating breakfast. You guys have to be on when that show starts. And that's a different type of waking up. So would you go to bed particularly early every night or how does this work? Is there a nap in the day? I, I'm I'm curious about the sleep habits. Of Peter it's a great Kramer. question. And there's a, uh, again, that's a second great question. Um, yeah, one to one. one for the record. Yeah. yeah. There's actually, a, that does have actually created like before I was saying, no, it didn't, but now that I've come back yeah. from that, <laughs> winning, <laughs> the great question, it means you're should win a Pulitzer. You know, what's the truth of it? It's like Apple TV has that show, the morning show. And I watched it and Aniston's, alarm clock goes off every three, like every day at 3 a.m. That's how they start the show. And it's like, okay, I sympathize with that. There's a lot of rough mornings. And my roughest mornings are those Monday mornings because I fly in from LA after the Fox pregame show back to New York. I don't get days off during the season and I don't get Mondays off because people watch on Mondays to see their team's highlights and all things. So those are the rough ones when it's like, all right, I get into bed at 11 o'clock on the East Coast. I didn't see my kid. My wife's asleep crawl in bed the alarm goes off and all right what do you got on Tua you know like let's go like let's roll and that's where you know it, it gets a lot but then at, at the end of the day Andrew like I'm talking about Tua I'm not you know in a coal mine I'm not digging ditches are there jobs in our industry that are way more lucrative probably are there jobs in industry that give more sleep and more like, vacation in the off season maybe but I, I haven't been gifted those jobs yet and I gotta I kind of admit like I might miss being the first person to talk at 7 a.m on the NFL now, I'm just curious, John, if I can go one more here. When you're on that flight back, yeah. now Peter Schrager went from emails and now definitely flying at least first if you're not oh, yeah. on your private jets. Come on. Um, the, <laughs> is the game on? How do you watch the yes. games? I mean, so, so I fly JetBlue, all right? Yep. And I am not endorsed by JetBlue. I fly JetBlue because they have direct Sunday tic- direct TV Sunday ticket currently on the JetBlue flights. So what I'll do is I'll have a cocktail. I'll get my little headphones. I'll plug in. I'm listening to Andrew Siciliano. We're going red zone, but they also have all the games. So if I didn't have that, honestly, I would be a fake. I'd be a fraud. I wouldn't be authentic. I I, I really do watch the games and I get the one o'clock window and the four o'clock window. And I always land at the same time, just as the four o'clock window is ending. So anyone who accuses me of not watching the game is full of crap because trust me, I watch the game. I got nowhere else to go. It's not bad, actually. I mean, in terms of uh, it's tough, but I mean, they, again, the air, you know, the whole thing, you're right. You're not, you're not digging ditches or anything like that, but it actually kind of works out schedule wise because with a family and stuff, not that they, and I'm sure they understand this is your job, but when you're away all week working and, you know, going hard all week that when you're home, they probably want to see you a little bit. This kind of allows you to focus on the games. Yeah. I think that's a cool uh, thing to say about like every of all of our families, like they know, like you were a, you were a baseball beat reporter. Like I, I cannot imagine like, you know, middle of June, Padres Mets both teams 20 games under 500 like I I don't know how you guys do it with families for me I justify it by saying I fly out Saturday morning I get back Sunday night it's only from August to uh, February and then I'm pretty present and you know what with the morning show I've got the great ability to pick my kid up from school and I love doing that so uh, it's it's a lot but I've got it pretty good compared to others in our industry. All right, so I, I want to go a, a final word. We have somebody inside the NFL right here, uh, a, t- a pod topic almost mm-hmm. every single uh, week. Uh, Peter, where's Sunday ticket headed? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Come on, where, you got to give us an answer. Why isn't it done yet? Why isn't it done yet? You got to get Brian Rolap or Hans Schroeder. You got to get says he, Rolap says he doesn't listen to the pod. Do you believe that? I, I think Roloff's ears are always open. That guy, that guy, he's too smart and too, uh, and too in tune with just about every uh, line of work for him not to know what you guys are talking about. I don't know. And I'm as curious as you guys are on that because I think the NFL network, NFL films, all that stuff we've been hearing about for 18 months, you know, where are they going to end up? Are they going to have partners? Are they going to be, you know, siloed? All that stuff is interesting. And as an employee of the NFL network who now works for the NFL as well, of course, you want to know uh, who's kind of at the levers on all these things. But the best thing I can do is just keep my head down and try to be as valuable as possible to whoever the new bosses are, the current bosses are, or whoever remains as the boss for as much as we know. Now, my last one, you, you do work for the NFL and NFL network and you're covering it. So, you know, obviously this is the way of the world right now, yeah. but do you get 
you know, there's some big topics that you guys have hit, you know, and you guys uh, are sometimes critical. Uh, but how does that work in terms of the feedback you get from, you know, the commissioner on down? Yeah, I've never, and I think Kyle would say the same thing. I've never been told what to say. And I've actually never had anyone at the league office say, you know, you were too rough on that. If anything, it's like, <laughs> I'll go ape, you know, I'll go bananas on um, like a call on a game. And then it will get like a, a PR person from the league will be like, you should talk to, you know, Al River on, or you should talk to, you know, Walt Coleman, like one of the reps, if you really want to clarify like what it went before just going, you know, off the deep end on, on a play call. But, you know, there's big issues. Talk about the Deshaun Watson thing. I think our show uh, kind of handled it in a really candid and open manner. And we're willing to take whatever heat it was. We talk about some of the ownership stuff that's happened over the last, you know, 18 months. We've got really good reporters. Like, I don't think anyone's going to you know, bat an eye at what Judy Bautista is reporting from the owner's meeting, you know, on Daniel Snyder. Um, we do our best, obviously, as a show uh, to be journalistic and, uh, you know, ethically in line with what the viewers deserve. We're not a PR shop. We're not, you know, carrying any water for anybody. And I think we're pretty critical based on, you know, all things considered that, uh, you know, the NFL Network is owned and run by the NFL owners. Great. Peter Schrager, big get. Uh, I could go over all the things you do, but this podcast, we try to keep it within, like when we have a guest within an hour. So yeah. uh, NFL Network, Fox Sports, the podcast, the season with Peter Schrager, big guest. Let me also plug Simmons. I'm on Simmons in the ringer. Yeah, Simmons the, you know, well. you know, I'll tell you, I walk around. That show, that pod, this will help that pod be, get some, get <laughs> some foothold. It. Bill this Simmons will help needs us. Simmons podcast. Uh, I get a lot like, you know, one set of 30 people that, you know, give a crap about football will nod their head at me in New York, you know, New York City, no one cares, but like I'll be in an airport and, you know, Good Morning Football's got a nice presence and kids and all this stuff. But I would say one out of every two guys from age 25 to 50 will be like, Schrager, tell Simmons to stop, you know, talking up the Patriots. They suck. And I'm like, all right, I guess you're listening. That's good. It's fine. Um, but uh, <laughs> I always Simmons. appreciate the feedback. You're good on Simmons. This will help for sure. This publicity will help Simmons get that podcast going. Uh, so good luck to, with that with him. But uh, our pleasure, uh, you know, busy schedule. And we do appreciate you joining us uh, on our podcast. Hey, guys, That's good, it. good, good questions. <laughs> Two one, two one. Yeah. I think he <laughs> downgraded from great to good. By the way, I don't know if you noticed <laughs> that. By the way, last thing for me: Do you have a Chris or Mike impersonation? Tariko or Collins uh, or no. Mad Dog? Okay, <laughs> come on. You knew I was. Well, you about definitely that. have one. You but definitely you have one. At the end? You find you strike me as a. You, are you kidding? I, I was listening to Jerome from Manhattan call about you know why the Knicks can't trade for Yao Ming when he was the first overall pick. Uh, this, I, my, I don't want to do an invitation. I respect those guys too much. I love them both. Um, I will say though, I did once see John Orand at a, what, who was, a, was it was a Grateful Dead. What was the, John, where'd I see you? It was a Grateful, was it Weir? Was it, we saw it was, it was, Bo it was Bobby Weir's <laughs> band at a, a NetJets party uh, in San Francisco for Super Bowl 50. <laughs> Somehow I conned my way into this party and I see John there just getting after it, listening to, you know, Casey <laughs> Jones. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> no video of that, Peter. No video it's of that. It's pre-Facebook. We're good. <laughs> right, thank you, Peter. Appreciate Thanks, you guys. Thanks, man. We've had a run, Andrew, of just likable guests. And uh, you, you know what really uh, struck me? We had him on for 30 uh, some minutes. He's talked to everybody in the business and he's, he, he mentioned... He has not burned a bridge yet, and I totally believe him. He's just he's just somebody that's out there making those cold calls, meeting people, and people just gravitate toward toward him. Well, you know what's interesting about it? I, I like I think anybody who's tried to get into the business, who got into the business, and then talks to people who are trying to get in the business, and you know the question always is how do you do it, right? And getting into sports media, it's not for most of the jobs. It's not like becoming. Um, you know, most other vocations or becoming a doctor where it's like, here's the blueprint. There's not really a blueprint, but I think if you listen to how Schrager did it, reaching out to a lot of people, um, being personable, not overdoing it, uh, you could see how he made it, right? He also has the personality. He's very good on TV. Uh, you know, he's someone, you know, uh, he's doing great with Fox Sports. 
uh, and NFL Network, but he's just someone I could see on those ESPN shows. Like he just kind of fits like the get up, um, you know, first take kind of, yeah, you know, it's a little different. Like he's just a little more conversational. He's not a hot takey, but, um, but just real good information and very good on TV, very relaxed. Uh, and you could hear it uh, in that interview, hopefully. Uh, and, I, and I thought he was real good. Yeah, that was fun. So we got some more big interviews lined up for the upcoming weeks as well. So we're looking forward to those as well. All right, you want to do our call of the week? Yeah, let's get into it. Call of the week. I didn't see this one live, Andrew. I saw it off of your Twitter feed because you gave a shout out to Richard Jefferson uh, on Yes Network, who addressed the Kyrie Irving situation. Um, I, I I thought he did a, a great job with it. Let, let, let's listen. Richard, you talked with Kyrie earlier today. I, I did speak to him to try and get some understanding and, and let him know that I, that I was going to you know address this on air and, and say that you know the, the the Alex Jones thing. I have a five and seven year old and. To know what that man did to those families, I, it, it was, it's hard for me to put them on words on air until we're going to get back to the basketball. But to me, the only people, person that can answer these questions is Kyrie Irving. And so if you're going to put that stuff up there, you're going to leave these things up there, then you have to answer these questions. And so, you know, hopefully we'll get some answers because, you know, if you're saying, if it's offending people and you want to leave it up there, then we need to understand why and why you are passionate about leaving that content up. Right. If you're being apologetic, why not take it down also? It's simple. All right, John, the thing I like first and foremost is Richard Jefferson went up to Kyrie Irving. Didn't sound like he got much of a response from Kyrie, but to me, that's important because there really isn't another side of this issue, right? There's anti-Semitism and that's it, right? And Kyrie, I mean, Kyrie is just terrible. Like it's just, again, it's, it's indefensible. Um, you know, he can, he posts this, um, you know, a, a link to this movie, it's anti-Semitic. Then he doesn't answer questions really about it and gets offended when people ask him about it. And it's just like, there's just no, def- he's a great basketball player. There's no defense for it, right? There's no other side. Um, but Richard Jefferson makes a, the right point. And he finally did take down the post and we're doing this podcast, you know, in the week, I, it's still to me, I'm um, not sure what's going to happen with Kyrie Irving. I feel like there's just, the story's not necessarily ending. I thought Richard Jefferson, he addressed the thing. Cause if when you don't take it down initially, you don't apologize. Well, then what are you doing for Kyrie Irving? And I understand like he wants to just kind of talk about being a leader and then not standing up for what you have to say. You have to have reasons for why you do things. And I don't think he really necessarily has these things aren't that well thought out. That's what it strikes me as. Um, And so um, I thought Richard Jefferson, there is a player community. Uh, I thought what he said was really good. Yeah, And there's not only a player community that sometimes you hear announcers try to, you know, uh, tiptoe around. You know, he's there to document what's happening on the court. But as a viewer, you appreciate them talking about what everybody else is talking about. And you can plainly see. And I thought that Richard Jefferson did a, a good job with that. Yeah, it was really good. All right. Good job, as always, by you. You know, for Big 12 uh, on Sunday with that story with uh, Michael Smith. Uh, and then we want to thank, of course, uh, our producers, AC Wyatt and Chris Mason, uh, who always put this together uh, every week. And the big get, Peter Schrager, was excellent. Uh, if you can review the pod, uh, give us the five stars and follow. Uh, that really helps, and we appreciate it, and we'll uh, see you next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.